Hi, my name is Olivia, and today I've got yet another wonderful guest that I'm so excited to share with you. His name is Francisco. He's known as the Wicked Witch of LA on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Francisco is a proud queer Mexican from San Diego who has heritage in Europe and indigenous Mexico. He's a devotee of La Santa Muerte and a practitioner of brujería. He uses his craft to keep his heritage alive and honor his ancestral home of Mexico. Aside from witchcraft, Francisco is a professional haunt actor, makeup artist, Halloween enthusiast, and lover of all things horror and occult. So without further ado, I'm so excited to introduce you to Francisco the Wicked Witch of LA. My whole audience has a lot of questions about working with La Santa Muerte, with kind of a personification of death, and we're gonna get into Mexican folk magic, but I do want to know just like a little bit of who you are and like, you know, just how did you start? What what was the catalyst for your practice? Okay, that's quite a story. Yeah, um, I'm here so, for it. So, I mean, growing, you know, Mexicans are very superstitious. It's a very superstitious and very spiritual country. So from a very young age, like as far back as I can remember, you're hearing folk stories, you're hearing things about history, creepy things that your witch aunt would do, you know? So I, I grew up hearing this stuff and it was kind of like a norm. We just hear these things all the time that Yorona is going to get you, that there's a chamuco under your bed, all these things. Um, so I was constantly surrounded by this stuff and was very like afraid of it as a kid, like terrified, utterly terrified of anything witchy and spiritual. Um, but you know, as I got older, it kind of like turned to curiosity. So that's kind of when I started like exploring things like, you know, like ghosts and the paranormal and things like that. And once I got into my teens, that's when I really, that's when it really hit me hard. Like, oh my God, like witchcraft, I can be a little bruja, what the heck? <laughs> like, this is real. Um, and it was around that time that Santa Muerte became more prominent in my life. So uh, I was seeing her everywhere and not, not just like as a spiritual like woo apparitions but it's really common in Mexico when you go to like a mercado or, or like a supermarket there's a botanica section a lot of supermarkets have this they'll just have a spiritual section so you know they have candles they have you know um, like saint candles they'll have like oils and incense things like that and like statues of saints and I was always captivated by like these enormous like immaculate Santa Muerte statues and I remember seeing one that looks just like this one and just being obsessed with her at the same time afraid <laughs> so it just kind of grew from there you know once I, I I turned 15 years old that's when I actually started practicing uh folk magic and it just skyrocketed from there and now here I am 100 years later <laughs> still doing the same shit perfect so you, I, I've spoken to other, both folk, folk practitioners and also just people who aren't practitioners, but um, are from the Mexican descent. And there's a lot of stigmas on Santa Muerte and her de devotees. And it's interesting because, you know, there's one, one side of it where people are like, just in love with her. And, you know, they're, they're like, so gracious towards her and have so much love for her and then there's that other side that people are like oh no i don't i don't fuck with her and so like what's your experience with both sides or because it sounds like you kind of went from one side and like teetered to the other mm -hmm. you know a lot of the fear surrounding santa muerte like and i've heard all that she's the devil or that she's a demon um she's a succubus um oh everything <laughs> wow. I've, I've heard <laughs> that she's like satan's wife and i'm like Oh, what? I'm like, oh, okay, okay. nice. <laughs> Somebody took my spot, okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, I grew up hearing all of that. And every time I heard that it came either from the Catholic church or someone who was usually a part of that kind of like that type of mindset, you know, the very like, if it's not God, it's evil and you shouldn't touch it. Um, that's most of like where that fear comes from is just that Catholic church um, ideology, like the institutional ideology of if it's not God, it's evil, don't question it. Just like that. Um, and there's, it, oddly enough, Mexico for having a history of honoring and venerating death all the way to like our indigenous ancestors. You know, we acknowledge death and walked with it daily. And then when, you know, 
Mexico was colonized, the fear of death came in. It was something that was brought into the country. So a lot of that influence of like fear and kind of like, I guess, like a hate towards Santa Muerte comes from that. Um, and people don't often question it because when, when you grow up in that faith, you know, you're taught not to question it. So you grow up with it, you teach your kids that, and it just kind of snowballs. And I grew up like that too. I grew up hearing that all these figures were evil and satanic. So I, I had that. And once I began actually working to Santa Muerte and praying to her and kind of got over that fear of death, that's when I saw that she was loving, that she was very motherly, very intense and still, you know, like she is death after all. So there's still kind of that respect you have to have for her and all that, but nothing demonic or evil, you know, it just wiped away every single like lie that I believed when I was younger and just, uh, it, it, my transition to venerating her was a really, really big journey for me. I can imagine. Yeah, a lot of devotees, their stories of working with her and having such a, and it's always an intense relationship. It's never like a light dabble, you know, like mm -hmm. there's, there, you're either in or you're out and is what I'm seeing, at least from a lot of devotees. And um, it's it's interesting because many of them, I mean, all of them explain it the same way of she's very intense. And I think I talk a lot about like the difference between dangerous and intense. And you kind of have to like start to learn that. That doesn't mean that she's not, mm -hmm. can't be dangerous. But, you know, like if you meet intense people, that doesn't always mean that they're dangerous because there's a lot of dangerous people who are not intense. And like, it's the same with, I think deities and spirits and um, and entities of such. So she was a really interesting uh, one to dive into. What? Where did you get all of your information when you first started, or did you just like go into temples or meet other devotees? Was there like a Discord server? Like <laughs> how how did you go about that? I mean, back in like back in those days, because um, that was almost fifteen years ago for me. Oh, okay. Um, you know, Discord wasn't a thing. Um, so a lot of my experience with Santa Muerte was very, very light in the beginning. It was very just like trying to read something online. And at the time, everything online was the same. She's evil. She's satanic. Don't work with her. Um, and I, there was like a gut feeling in me like, no, this isn't true. Like there's like she's death. Like because my mind went, if death is so evil, then why does God depend on it so much? Mm -hmm. Can't be evil then. So as time grew, I did meet other devotees throughout my life. Um, there are temples. Um, there was a, a, a temple that I'd seen when I was in uh, Yucatan a couple years ago, like about a little over 10 years ago, that really, really drew me in. But the biggest thing that somebody taught me, uh, a devotee I knew a long time ago was, there is no Bible for Santa Muerte. There is no official book for her. She is an experience. You just have to experience her, you know, honor her, you know, follow, you know, her traditions, but ultimately she is going to be the one to guide you how to venerate her. She's going to be the one to give you her experience. So when I went into that mindset, that's when things really started to click and really started to make sense for me. And that's when I really began to experience her, you know, who she was and what she can do. For people who are feeling drawn to work with her, at least to get to know her, do you have any tips or like 101 of like do's and don'ts of type of thing for La Santa Muerte? I mean, definitely talk to multiple devotees. Um, I would say never talk to just one, talk to multiple because every devotee practices her veneration differently. You know, some devotees practice her from a Catholic lens um, and some will practice her from a folk lens lens so me I practice from a folk lens I don't um approach her with a catholic um approach if that makes sense so talk to multiple people and right now there are a lot of books out there read books do research um but ultimately you're gonna have to come to your consensus you cannot depend on just a book create information but it's something you just have to experience and hearing other people's experience is probably going to be your best teacher in this bet um well, uh, sorry I didn't mean to if you, if oh no you're good go ahead go ahead oh i was gonna ask like you're saying that there's a lot of books out there now do you have books that you would recommend 
Yeah, um, there's one book. I actually have it. It just happens to be next to me. Um, I had a feeling that this question would come up, so I was like, Of course. I, I mean, I read um, <laughs> one, so. Oh, I love that book. Such a good one. La Santa Muerte good. by Tomas Brower. Oh my goodness, this book is my go-to. You know, I whenever I read a book about Santa Muerte, I'm very like, okay, let's see what this is about. You know, I always have like my doubts, but this book was just, it has great history. I love that it includes her indigenous history, mm-hmm. which is very, very important for any type of anything magic, magic-y. Is that a word? Magic-y? Magic-y it know. is now. Magic-y. <laughs> um, you know, in Mexico, like, if it includes indigenous history, you kind of already won me over you know, um, great history. It goes over her symbolism a lot. Um, it even has like spell work at the end that you can do for her. It's absolutely fantastic book, 100% recommend. Yeah, I love that book too. It's one of my mm-hmm. favorites, I think. Um, yeah, it's on my favorite shelf. <laughs> the favorite shelf. shelf. My favorites, yeah. Um, That's how you know. You said that there, like some people approach her with Catholic lens and then a folk lens. What, what do those look like? What's the differences? Mm-hmm. So when you look at the Catholic lens, um, people will see her more as a saint. So Santa Muerte, instead of Santa being holy, it's saint. So she is just another saint like, um, like San Judas, um, San Miguel, all these, you know, all these other saints in the Catholic um, pantheon. And whenever you approach Santa Muerte, you have to approach her through God first. So you have to ask God for permission to invoke death. So he's, he kind of stands almost like a middleman between you and Santa Muerte. Whereas with folk, um, I guess like folk Santa Muerteism, <laughs> I don't know what to call it. Um, you know, you, you acknowledge that death exists everywhere, that death exists in your body, that death is acting in your body constantly. Therefore, Santa Muerte is always there for you. You know, if you look at your, your own biology, your your body has died multiple times. All of your cells have died and regenerated. So you have experienced death as a whole multiple times throughout your lifetime. Therefore, death has been a part of you and people don't think about that. And that's more of a folk approach that she has always been a part of you and always walks within you. I love that answer. That's such a good answer. (laughs) So the folk practice, you said that you do a lot of Mexican folk practice Mm -hmm. what does that look like because that's really curious to me I do a lot of Filipino and I think that like the Hispanic colonization Mm -hmm. kind of like you know so I'm I'm really curious what that looks like for you like is there a certain divination that you use or like certain spell work structure yeah (laughs) what's interesting about uh Mexican folk, folk magic or brujeria is it is such a melting pot you know, within Mexican folk magic, you have so many influences. I mean, you have um, Kabbalistic, you have Irish, you have Chinese, Haitian, Cuban, African. You have, because over, over the history of Mexico, you had so many countries that have come into Mexico and many of them have brought their folk magic traditions. So different parts of Mexico, you'll see, you know, the further down south you go, you're going to see a lot of um, Cuban influence. You're going to see a lot of African influence. If you go right now to Baja, you're going to see a lot of Haitian voodoo. Interesting. You know, it, it's very regionalistic, you know, where you're at. Same thing in Baja, you'll see a lot of Chinese magic. You'll see a lot of uh, folk practices from different parts of uh, China and um, Asia in, as a whole. So it's always going to be depending on what region you're in. So it can change very drastically. You know, there's not just one look for brujeria. There's hundreds of look varying by the different states. You know, what people practice in Durango or Yucatan is going to look different from someone practicing in Chihuahua or Zacatecas. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very, very wide. But the general pattern that you see in brujeria is you're always going to see a mix of indigenous practices with um, colonialistic religions like Christianity and Catholicism or other Judeo-Abrahamic um, religions. So you always see this blend of things. Oh, I love that. I love the fact that it's so like colorful and it's not just like one specific way. Oh yeah, and people don't think about that. Um, people don't see as Mexico as a melting pot. 
you know, they think it's all one thing, like, oh, Mexico's one thing and it's the same all over. But when you really start to experience Mexico and you travel in Mexico and you see all these cultural influences that have built up what it is, you know, what Mexico is today, it's, it's mind boggling. It's amazing. Yeah. That's yeah. why I, I think that's why Mexico is such a colorful country. Yeah. Do you have a specific tool that you love to use or like a divination thing? <gasps> yes, I do. Yes, I do. Ooh, yeah. Um, Call me a stereotypical Mexican, but I love my maraca. Oh, how do you use those in your practice? Um, oh my God, there's so many ways. So it's really good for raising vibrations. It's, you can use this for calling in spirits, raising your ancestors. You can use this for, um, for cleansing ceremonies. A lot of noise-making tools are really common in, in um, cleansing ceremonies. So whenever I'm doing limpias for people, um, which if anyone watching doesn't know, Olympia is uh, Mexican folk spiritual cleansing. Um, a lot of times I'll finish it off with, with a maraca. You know, you can use it to cleanse equally to bless. Um, it's something I used to call my ancestors. So whenever I'm at the altar, you kind of create a beat. You know, you move with it, you dance with it. I mean, it's used for music also. Mm-hmm. You know, music in Mexico is, is magical. It's, I mean, you've listened to Mexican songs. Like yeah. there's life in it there's yeah. it's very this, like it it sounds like sunshine yes oh my god you just it sounds like sunshine, sounds like sunshine. yeah it's so it's, i love it <laughs> it brings life so whenever i use my maraca to call in spirits you're you're giving life to spirit you're giving life to your ancestors you're giving them a reason to like get up and move you know yeah oh i love that i absolutely love that so much yeah there's a it's definitely probably, yeah. drums that are used when doing rituals and so like i I love the like drumming, but like a maraca, I guess. I'm, I'm always thinking of like the gourds, you know, like the gourd uh, with the seeds and after you dry them out, you shake them and stuff. Mm-hmm. I think of those, but I guess for some reason, not maracas, same, same thing, same gist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Oh yeah. And I think for divination, divinations are a hard one. I mean, I'm, I, I love osteomancy. That's been probably my favorite form of divination. I love my bones. I really love my bones. Um, but there is also, um, Maize reading, um, where you get the corn kernels, and uh, once they're dried out, you know, um, corn kernels, you know, they have that one side that has like the indent, has like the little like seed pit on mm-hmm. one side. So you basically mark every corn kernel with a significance, like one for finances, one for health, one for living, love, things like that. And you toss them kind of like an osteomancy. And depending on whether it's seed up or seed down, would be like a yes or no, a positive or a negative outcome. Oh, interesting. I've never heard of that before. So that's like a really, really old, old school way of, of reading. Um, some people will mix in different types of like beans or frijoles, um, rice, they'll mix it in. And sometimes depending how the beans fall, how many rice um, accumulate around one kernel can tell you other outcomes. You know, if there's like a lot of rice, okay, it looks like this outcome is going to be very prosperous. Um, if you get a lot of beans in one area, it could be like, okay, it looks like there's going to be some challenges here. So you can kind of divinate using like rice, beans, and corn. That was a very old school way of doing it. Oh, I've, I've never heard of that before. That's really interesting. It's fun. It's fun. And, yeah. and when you're done, you can cook them up and eat them. It's great. Oh, <laughs> you're like, great. Now I've also got a snack. <laughs> and I've got a snack. Perfect. I love that. Is there, uh, like, for anybody who's trying to read, like, get into Mexican folk magic and like connect mm-hmm. with their roots. Is there anything that you'd suggest to them to any place to start or anything to start doing or mm-hmm. perspective shifts? Um, definitely start looking into the history of Mexico. Um, that's a really, really important thing because all Mexican folk magic is rooted in our indigenous land. You know, all Mexican folk magic is always going to point to the direction of honoring the ancestral home, always. All brujeria honors the ancestors because without them, we wouldn't be here. They're the ones that gave us our magic. They're the ones that taught us the tools. So it's a lot of ancestor work. And because of that, you, it, it's important to become familiar with the history, learn about the indigenous people. You know, If you're looking at a, a magic from a specific state, like let's say you're looking at Jalisco, the state of Jalisco, Maybe you want to learn about the Huichol people. You know, if you're looking at um, Baja North, the uh, Northern Baja, maybe you want to look at like Chumash or Chomichi people, you know, and learning about them and 
how things changed once the colonizers came, what they introduced and how magic changed, you know, it's really important to learn about that. You know, you can't have folk magic without history. It's impossible. Yeah, yeah that's, it's impossible to try to just jump in and not know anything about the history for sure. Exactly. Uh, shifting back to Santa Morte, mm -hmm. um, the, I mean, I, I see that you have a couple of statues back there. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. from my understanding, each color you work with separately or they have, um, you know, specific workings that can be attached to them. Mm -hmm. Like, do you want to give us a little bit more information on that? Or do you have like a specific color that you like working with more? Mm -hmm. Are there candles that you feel like work really well that aren't specifically La Santa Morte, but you're like, there's something about it that she just loves, mm -hmm. goes good on my altar. Like, I want to know more mm -hmm. about like the, the workings. I'm curious. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when it comes to statues, so I love, okay, I love my statues. <laughs> I'm always buying more. I shouldn't because I'm running out of room, but I'm going to keep buying more anyway. Just get more so, room. <laughs> exactly. I sh I'll make more room. Right. Um, so when it comes to statues, now, if anyone wants to get into like a veneration or something like that, you don't need a statue. Um, I've told people if, if you're practicing something within secret, save a photo of her on your album and just have that out when you're praying for her. That's simple. Um, but so the statues of Santa Muerte, you know, the robes each have a meaning and they kind of cover a different aspect of Santa Muerte. Now, the robe colors is for us. It's not for her. It's for us to connect with an aspect of her. So if you're practicing a lot of magic, cultism, or you're doing really destructive work and painful magic, you would work with La Negra. You would work with the black-robed Santa Muerte. And again, that's not for her. She already, it's Santa Muerte is Santa Muerte, regardless of the robe you get, you, you know, that she's colored in. It's just for us to visually connect. And to, it, it's sympathetic. It's like sympathetic magic. You're connecting with the aspects of that color. So you're invoking that side of her. You know, so you have like La Negra for that. You have La Roja, the red, which is, you know, for works of like love, sex, passion, and attraction. And then you have La Blanca, the white rope, which is, you know, purification. This is, um, you know, cleansing work, very light workings. This is something that's probably the most gentle side, the most like motherly side. Those are her three traditional colors, the black, the red, and the white. And then you have like a whole array of like, other colors, the whole rainbow. So you have, you know, purple, blue, green, um, gold, silver, gray, brown, like the entire spectrum is there. Um, if you don't have a robe color you want, that's okay. Santa Muerte is Santa Muerte at the end of the day. So if you really want to work with La Negra, but you can't afford a black statue, that's fine. She's not going to be mad at you. You're, you can probably still invoke La Negra. But I personally love, I have one of the rainbow ones right here, like right here. The rainbow one is my favorite because that to me feels more motherly because, you know, like um, as, a, as, a, as a gay person, you know, I, I personally don't have a good relationship with my parents, you know, being gay. So when I saw Santa Muerte rainbow, I was like, oh my God, like I felt so accepted, so represented. So that's more, hands down my favorite statue. Yeah, I, I know every time I go into the Botanica, I'm always like, it's like there's there they have these huge like massive resins. Oh, they're yes. they're almost the size of me. I mean I'm not a large I'm not very like mm -hmm. tall you know but they are pretty big and they're all resin and they are layered with like specific colors um, and there's different trinkets that the resin is in like that is in the resin. So mm -hmm. it's built of these like different layers of colored resin with like charms in each one representing and I was like one of these days yeah I'm just, I was like one of these uh, days I'm gonna walk in here and I'm gonna be weak and I'm gonna have the money on me and I'm just gonna be like just, just do it just like do here it. you go yeah Th there's one statue that I'm obsessed with and it's her it's probably I think it's like like three it's like almost a, a yard and it's her in this beautiful glittery rainbow dress she's holding a globe and she's like posing and she has these oh. large rainbow wings that are also glittery and she looks so regal and i saw that and i was like bitch <laughs> mama is working today mama ooh. so this is another thing is working with her and speaking to a lot of different devotees they always tell me that the results and the outcomes are very 
apparent um, and abrasive sometimes. Mm -hmm. And is that your experience as well of like whatever working it is, whether it's blessing or bane, it's usually very like, okay, here, like it's like kind of abrasive. Mm -hmm. Very much so. You know, the, the thing with Santa Muerte is yes, she's, a, you know, she can be a total mom. Yes, she can be very loving and caring, but she's also like 100% like no bullshit. What you ask for is what you will get. And that's why a lot of people will say, be very careful of what you ask of her because she will give it. If you're invoking Santa Muerte for baneful work, if you're about to, I don't know, curse your cousin Pepe or whatever, um, be careful what you ask for because you may not like the results that you see, you know. I, I see a lot, I, I've heard of people that go to Santa Muerte and they're like, please give me this, this, this man, you know, as a partner, I want him, I'm obsessed with him, please give him to me. And Santa Muerte's like, are you sure? And they're like, yes, please. And she's like, okay, here you go. And the dude ends up being terrible. You know, I mean, you got him though. Yeah, you, you got him, but you don't want, now you, now you don't want him. So, yeah. you know, you, you have to be very specific with Santa Muerte and be very sure of what you want. Um, and one of the things that I've kind of learned over the years is, you know, I'll be like, Santa Muerte, I really want this, but you know my necessities as well as I do. If this is something I want, but it's not what I need, then yeah, you can take care of that for me. You know, it's, okay. you just got to be very careful what you ask her. She yeah. will deliver. And you found, you found a uh, success in that of basically being like, Hey, I want this, but if you know that this is not good for me, then like, just don't. And you found success mm -hmm. in kind of making that, that barrier, that boundary there. Yes. 100%. Oh, okay. She, she, she knows, I mean, she knows us you know, she, yeah. she is a part of us, you know, I always say a lot of times she might know us better than we know ourselves, you know, so a lot of times she kind of anticipates, you know, when I'm like, something, what they really want this, but I don't know if it's a good idea, but I kind of still want it, and she's like, okay, no, not happening, and, you're like, and I'm like, oh, oh. <laughs> I'm like, but, but I want it, and she's like, Okay, fine. Here you go. And then it ends up, I'm like, oh my god, everything's going to share something worth it. And I'm like, something worth it. My life's terrible. Help me. And she's like, dumbass. I told you. <laughs> she's very much like Mexican mom. Like she will yeah. whip out a chancla and like hit you. One hundred percent. I love that. I mean, that makes sense, though. That makes sense. You know, I think it's interesting. She's such an interesting um, form of death because you know every 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 culture has their personification of death, right? Mm -hmm. But she is different than all of them because it's almost like she is death, right? Like it's not, she's not just the personification. She's not just this deity of death or like a psychopomp, like she is death itself. Yeah. I don't think that there's any other, I mean, there may be, but I don't think that there's any other deities that are so prominent that are not like, death mm -hmm. and also life or death and like kind of like persephone or like yeah Hate or you know there's like a lot of different other deities that are i guess um linked with death but they're not they are not death itself and i think that she's exactly. that's really interesting so hearing people work with her it's always interesting <laughs> because it's kind of like you have to be really particular about the way that you work with her it sounds like of like yes she can manifest things for you but she is not somebody I, or she's not someone who like creates things it's almost like getting like destroying the barriers in your way to go get something is what mm -hmm. is my understanding so you kind of have to like think really creatively when you're working with her is that true 110 percent. i mean because <laughs> santa muerte is an action and a transition you know she like you said like she doesn't create things She's an action and she's a transition. So when you ask for Santa Muerte, like Santa Muerte, please help. I'm in a financial crisis. I need something to help, you know, save me. Okay. She's not going to just create money for you. She's going to perform an action that gets you somewhere. She's going to create a, trans a transition for you to get to where you need to be so you can achieve it yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes, she is capable of miracles. I I've experienced them myself. Um, but much like what death is, death is an action and a transition. And that is her nature as a whole. Do you have any like um, experiences with San La Santa Muerte that you'd be interested in sharing or like, comfortable sharing? 
Yeah, uh, there's actually one big one. And this is the one that like 100% convinced, convinced me like, oh shit, she's like the real deal. Yeah. So I share this with a lot of people. I may get a little emotional, so bear with. That's okay. I'm, you know, all the good stories are usually like that. All the, you know, they're, they're yeah, they're, they'll be good. So this was about, um, I want to say maybe a little over, <clears throat> maybe like 12, 13 years ago, I want to say. So it was a time that my grandma had passed away from my mother's side. So we went over for the holidays, for the Christmas holidays to visit my grandma. M- May she rest in peace. But this old bat did not know what day of the week it was. So every holiday I'd be like, abuela, guess what time it is? And she's like, what? And I'm like, it's Christmas. And she's like, really? I'm like, yes, it's Christmas. Bust out your tree. <laughs> she, she, yeah, she, she was a very interesting woman. Um, so we went over, you know, uh, three days before Christmas Eve and we're, we get to her house. My aunt answers the door and she's like, oh, like grandma's not feeling well today. She's in bed. She has like a little cold. And I was like, oh, that sucks. And I was like, all right, let me go in and say hi to my grandma. So my grandma's like sitting on her bed. And as soon as I walk into my grandma's room, it felt like I had the most tight and darkest grip over me. Like I felt like something was like like this presence was just like enveloped in the room completely it wasn't scary or evil but it was dark very very strong and that was probably the one of the biggest apparitions I've ever seen and I just remember seeing slightly turning I just see this tall figure just all clad in black and being afraid that's when I was afraid when I saw this tall figure and I was like in shock like I couldn't even say hi to my grandma properly because I was just like, like, what the fuck is happening here? And all I hear is, she's coming with me. I'm going to take her. And three days later, my grandma passed away. Oh my God. Yeah, that would, that would definitely be really world, like shell shocking. Oh yeah. It was absolutely insane because I could have asked Santa Muerte, please don't take my grandma. But she's like, no, I'm taking her. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing with Santa Muerte. She gets what she wants. You know, she's um, an unstoppable force. Mm-hmm. You know, you can petition certain things about Santa Muerte, but at the end of the day, it's her. You know, she calls the shots. Right. You know, wow. and that's kind of when I realized how immense she was, was experiencing that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I couldn't imagine that. Oh, my God. Um, well, I mean, like that has, has working with her changed your relationship. I mean, I'm sure it changed your relationship with death and the way that you view that and like the way that you view and interact with the spirits of the past or mm-hmm. cemetery workings, if you do those. Mm-hmm. Oh, 100%. I mean, the thing with Santa Muerte is that she is death, but she is also the mother of the dead. So she watches over the death. She's just as people experience that she's so prominent with the living like we talk about oh my god she's so big with the living and she's so involved she's way more involved with the dead way more so a lot of times when I'm working with ancestors or I'm working you know if I'm doing cemetery work or just in you know spirits of of our of our beloved dead you know she's a big part of that and invoking her has really, really, really helped me connect more with these spirits, you know? And you, you begin to experience more, like just cleaner communication. Your conjurings are a lot stronger. You feel more protected. Cause you know, working with the spirits of the dead, you know, you, you still want to protect yourself. You know, there are still some, you know, not all ancestors are good ancestors. I always tell people, be careful who you're venerating. Um, but you really begin to experience how much power she has and how much of a protector and healer she is of the dead. It, it's mind boggling how much she can really in- explode that area of your spirituality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that when you meet people who work with either death, La Santa Morte, or just the dead in general, people who are, I guess, necromancers in a sense, um, mm-hmm. in a way, to make it a cool word, are usually the most lively which I think is really interesting they're usually the you know like they're usually the ones that are enjoying life a lot more because they I think so much of their practice so much of their 
their mind space is taken up with the idea and the understanding that everything is temporary. And mm -hmm. um, so I, I like, you know, again, like, especially devotees, like I'm, I noticed that a lot that many of them are very, they're very lively, they're colorful, they'll, they're full of like passion and like they want to, they want to live life and be human, you know, and they, they embrace that. And I think that's really beautiful. Oh, 100%. I mean, the more I've worked, like me personally, that I've worked with Santa Muerte, the more I, exactly, you know, I've experienced like the joys of life, you know, she, she, for being dead, she has an interesting way of making you feel alive again, you know, like, and I think one of the things that has brought me so much joy in life and has made me feel so alive and, you know, e even through hard times is this isn't the end, you know, yes, my human, my life as a human is temporary, but there is still a, a life as, as a spirit ahead of me. So, and knowing that she's still going to take care of me beyond that, it, it's kind of like, I feel like I'm good. You know, when you see how big the world is and that, you know, the, the spiritual realm beyond this is so much bigger than what we can imagine, some, the little things in life just don't irk you as much, you know. Yes, paying bills can be stressful. Yes, you know, breaking up with someone is hard or, you know, stubbing your toe. But what is that compared to the blessings that Santa Muerte can give you? What is that compared to the, the experiences that life and that the afterlife can give us? It doesn't. Yeah. No, I agree with that. I think it's, I, I definitely, I definitely see it. And you can also just like see those little things too of like what, a blessing it is to just be human or just to be alive like even in the mornings I'll just like sit there as like the sun is coming through my blinds and I'm just like mm -hmm. it's just so beautiful you know like and it's mm -hmm. I, I see it every single morning but it's just like there's just something about like quiet mornings with the sun rising yeah. like it's just there's nothing like it you know things like that or a really good cup of coffee fuck Ooh. a really good cup of coffee yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. a good, yes. a good glass, uh, for me, a good class of like horchata in the morning. Oh, oh my God. You know, I, I got some, at the, my friend bought me some at the mall because they were like, oh, they have horchata. And I was like, ooh. And I tasted it and I was like, ugh. Like, I was like, I don't know. It was, I was so sad. Like, it was just like. It was, was it like the powder? Home. I don't know. I don't know. What, like, they, they just got me like this because they were like, oh, they, they have like these huge ones. And I was like, okay. Like, I love horchata. And, I haven't had it in a while. It's a good summer drink, you know? And so they like brought it to me and it was like this big, like huge cup. And uh, I took one sip and I was like, like, I don't, like, I, no. I, I don't, I wonder if they like cleaned the the container or something. Cause it tasted like, mm -hmm. I was like, ooh. yeah. So I was like, you know like, what? I'm ooh. just going to like throw like, that this away. Like Windex -y. This tastes like Windex. Mm. Yeah. I was like, I was going for Clorox. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Where's the Clorox? Oh my God. Oh no. Um, but you're so right. Like it's, it's, it's the little things, you know? I mean, one of my favorite things to, you know, in, in the morning I do like my prayers to Santa Muerte. And one of my favorite things to pray is thank you for allowing me to feel the wind on my skin, for letting me hear leaves rustling, you know, for letting me feel the heat of like a flame for feeling like, you know, that coolness of water, you know, going down my, you know, my throat into my body. Like People don't think about these little things, you know, they, yeah. you know, they miss out on that. Like, it's like you looking at the sun, like you're witnessing a star rising. Like, <laughs> yeah, what? I think it's like when you, when you like think about it, like of just how crazy existence itself is and like existing as you is just, it, it can send you in a whole spiral, but it's also just, it's just mind boggling, you know? Mm -hmm. And like, I, so I, um, I, I work with a lot of people in like entomology and clearly I really like uh, insects and um, we were out and they pointed out, uh, what is it, a, a tarantula hawk. And for those of you who don't know what a tarantula hawk is, they're these beautiful wasps. They're, they're, mm -hmm. about, they're about this big and they're like this blue metallic, they're gorgeous. But the thing is, is like the way that they, lay their eggs is they find a spider they find a tarantula and they lay the egg inside of the tarantula alive they paralyze it alive and then as the eggs hatch they hatch inside the spider and eat it alive and like that's some alien like that's some like sci-fi mm -hmm. crazy but it's just 
it's part of our world. And that's the fact yeah. that like, we're just like, oh, whatever, it's a bug. It's like, no, it's it's this like, insane, no. <laughs> it's this insane like creature that lives alongside of us. I don't know. It's just, it's a whole thing. Mm -hmm. Nature's sure scary. Them. Yeah, yeah. Nature's, I mean, but nature's that duality. It's like this yeah. beautiful thing that is so terrifying, you know, and it can Ex be. Mm -hmm. I, and, and here's the thing is like, and, and kind of like circling back to like, like brujeria and like what, what Mexican folk magic is, is brujeria has, is not like love and light and like, oh my God, you know, I'm gonna go hug a tree. <laughs> you know, <laughs> brujeria is a reflection of nature, the land you stand on. Nature can feed you and keep you healthy and be beautiful and it will equally destroy your home and make you sick or poison you unapologetically yeah it's like it's that's different. nature it's, that is folk magic you know folk yes. magic and i feel like almost wherever you are in the world like folk magic is going to acknowledge that you know it's you know it's very much you know it's very on par with what traditional witchcraft is you know i consider myself a traditional witch because i work with the land and you know people paint like oh i i'm a nature witch and i work with nature and they paint it as something beautiful where there's probably a hundred things in nature that want to eat you Right. Like, have you been to Australia? Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> you've been to Australia before? <laughs> a nature no. with Australia. I mean, I'd be like, no, that's okay. I, that's <laughs> it's, it's a continent that's out to get you. It is. Yeah. The whole, the whole continent. The whole continent yeah, is like, ooh, pray. Mm. <laughs> I don't know about that. Yeah. Yep. Uh, it's interesting, too, because, like, I mean, I think at the core of my practice, especially, is balance is liminal space be like being in the liminal as much as i can um in every sense of the way and i think that that's really important for especially folk practitioners you know like especially folk practitioners of like you need to understand that duality of like both nature of being both beautiful and destructive but also like seeing both sides of the coin seeing both sides of the argument so if you're in one side and the other it's like you need it doesn't mean you need to agree with the other person, but like mm -hmm. at least understand where they're coming from or understand yeah. why they're so passionate about defending themselves about something, you know, X, Y, and Z and being in that lim liminal of like everything. I mean, I work with death in both my practice and also I make what my mom likes to call death crafts. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, like I, I usually, I collect roadkill and dead bugs and things like that mm -hmm. and I make art into them. But I also love gardening. I love to, grow life you yeah. know so it's like being able to exist in this duality of working really closely with both death and life and like beauty and ugliness I guess bless yeah. Spain I think that's just one of the things that gets overlooked a lot I think it's said but it's it's not put into practice as often as I would like to see it in these mm -hmm. days and I think doing death work or um working with a death deity or spirit especially like less of the more it's like that teaches you those things you know 100 percent. it's working with death is is an eye-opener it's it's an eye-opener and anyone can do it you know there's a lot of fear around death work because you know especially like like you know from what i hear with like santa muerte people say like oh you know i'm afraid to work with santa muerte because if i mess up she's gonna take the life of my dog which no that's not gonna happen um i guarantee you um you know, they, they, they fear that death will enter their home and take something. And no, that's not how it works. You know, when you welcome death into your home, death has already, already always been there. You know, death exists everywhere. You know, life cannot exist without death being a constant force. You know, it's nothing to fear. You know, when, when you step over that hill and you just acknowledge its presence, its importance and its value, working with Santa Muerte becomes a lot easier, mm -hmm. especially once you find out how much of a mom she is. Yeah, well, and you know, it's it's interesting too, because especially in nowadays and especially in America, you know, death is like this thing that we try to pretty up a lot of the time and, and try mm -hmm. to make sure that people don't see it when at our roots like this, it was like a big part of community, like, you know, mourning and funerals and um, understand and like, ancestor work was such a a core piece of community and i think it's it's so sad that that's lost upon us because you know i mean like just google the history of the term living room mm -hmm. i'm gonna let you you know like 
whoever's curious about that, just Google the history and it's, it's I'm going to do it. Yeah, you should. It's, it's really fascinating. Um, but it's, it's kind of sad that we just kind of brush this aside of like, oh, death doesn't happen. We live forever, you know, and there's this whole thing of like this fear of getting older and withering away when it's like, that's what we're made to do, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I do have a book though for people watching. Also, oh, look, it's also by Tomas, um, Morbid Magic. An amazing book, incredible. Ooh, I haven't book. read that one, but I, I've seen it. I've been wanting oh, to get it. Oh, you should. It's fantastic. It's it's a lot about. It goes through like all over the world, um, and mm -hmm. talks about kind of like death practices and the way it's viewed and the way it's dealt with. Um, it's funeral. relatively new, right? Yes, it is a newer. I think. Well, I don't think it's ridiculously new. I think it was maybe in the last couple years. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's definitely worth reading. Yeah, twenty nineteen. So it's relatively pretty new. Mm -hmm. but he's a great author i recommend anyone yeah he's, he's an incredible author i think morbid magic was the first one i read by him and then i read um la santa muerte and i was like this is an incredible book um and i also had that book i think mine has like a little bit of it has a little bit of like warping to it like i i mm -hmm. took this one on um like one of my road trips when i was like mm -hmm one of my many road trips, but I was very much in a really transitional, like it was half healing, half like ready to destroy everything in my path. Um, so mm -hmm. reading this book while I was like, oh, this is kind of therapeutic, you know, like I feel good about yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, it was fantastic. Death is so therapeutic, isn't it? It, it honestly <laughs> really is. Um, I just think, I think there's a lot of things that we fear as a society, especially like death or anger that if looked at in the right lens and utilized in the right way, it can be really, um, really healing and really, I'm just thinking of venerating. Is that a word? I think that is. Yeah, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm gonna hold we'll on. take it is now. <laughs> it is now. Yeah. Okay. That was used in a slightly correct way. We're going <laughs> to go with it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to end this one here and then we're going to move over to patreon because my patrons get to ask you exclusive questions q a style mm -hmm. like directly but i really appreciate you coming on and talking about everything mexican folk magic and your really interesting um personal experiences and lessons from what they like i love it so Thank you. if you do not already follow francisco i will link everything down below you really need to fantastic content very educational and also just gorgeous person so yeah. That was my interview with Franny. I hope that you enjoyed as much as I did. If you would like to see the extended version where my Patreons just Q&A style ask him questions about his practice and himself, then you can go ahead and head over to Patreon. That also gives you the opportunity to ask any questions for any of my future interviewees. Otherwise, that's all I have for you for this video. And as always, thank you so much for watching. Best of luck. Be kind to each other and may your gods treat you as you've treated others. Bye.